Hi, everyone. Welcome to our talk of machine learning at the Edge Cloud. I'm Vivek Hariran, a machine learning engineer by profession at a top tech company. And I'm Prakash Ramchandran, and uh, I'm Interop work, Working Group Chair uh, and a Telco Cloud Specialist. And let's get started. And to start with, uh, we want to say that our view, the views expressed in this presentation are definitely our own and doesn't necessarily represent our respective companies. So what is machine learning? Um, the AI pioneer Arthur Samuel coined the term as the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So some classic machine learning use cases that a lot of us would have experienced is like spam detection, um, character identification and written character recognition, um, line of credit approval or not, a lot of banks use this, um, and recommendations. I think a lot of us use Amazon. And, uh, we probably interacted with one of these. So how does the computer do it? To illustrate or to explain this, I'm gonna go after a simple example. Let's say that we're, we give the computer a bunch of pictures of animals and we ask it to find all the ducks from this group. So there are two ways for us to teach the computer to actually learn this particular task. Um, so in machine learning, the two classes are supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, we're only gonna focus on the supervised learning part. So for supervised learning, we actually need to give the data set as well as a set of labels. Um, so when I say data set, it basically means a picture uh, for a data point, uh, and then uh, a set of features which are typically human defined. So in this case, I'm saying that uh, the first image actually has two feet, uh, has feathers and has beak. Those are the, the features. And then a label of some sort. So we're saying that we're letting the computer know that the first image is a duck and the second is not and so on. So once we've given the computer the features and um, a label, we can actually feed all of this into a few algorithms that will actually find the relationship between the feature and the label. So the goal of these algorithms are typically to try to minimize the mistakes that they make. So they have to find a way to combine the features uh, to correctly identify whether that first image is a duck or not. Some of the classic machine learning algorithms um, are like logistic regression, which actually allows the computer to find linear relationships between the features and the label. Um, decision trees, uh, which makes use of the classic uh, binary tree or, or tree structure, data structure, uh, to determine uh, if which, fe the, which feature actually leads to one class or the other. And uh, a simple neural network, which actually allows for nonlinear relationships between the features and the output by adding a hidden layer in between the two. So in supervised learning, the, the step that we just covered is called the training step. Um, and that is equivalent to actually uh, writing a program or writing a piece of code. Um, the output of the training step is typically called a model. Uh, and that model can be used in the future to determine whether a given animal is a duck or not. So the second step typically is the evaluation step, which is equivalent of actually deploying your piece of code into production. Um, so in the case of machine learning uh, 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 use cases, the model is wrapped with your web app code and deployed into production. So recently with the advancement of like higher processing power with the use of GPUs and large volumes of data, uh, there's been a huge leap in neural networks. Um, so I think a lot of you might've heard it uh, and that's deep learning. So the major advantage of deep learning is uh, it takes care of the feature extraction part for you. So classic machine learning actually allowed or actually needed the data scientists to actually define a bunch of features by hand, by doing analysis of the data. Deep learning sort of also automates that. 
Um, it's a lot harder to interpret what the model is doing, but it much closer mimics to how a brain acts, how a human brain acts. So uh, in, our, in going back to our training example, uh, instead of give, defining features, all we had to do was give the picture and give the label. And the deep learning model automatically determines which set of features are useful for it to predict if it's a duck or not. So the algorithm is, has become so popular that it has led to a rise in popularity in both machine learning and deep learning. To sort of illustrate the point of how good deep learning really is, um, I'm gonna go over a, a, an object detection example. So in research, uh, there's a competition called Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge, uh, where they make use of a corpus of images with labels called ImageNet uh, to actually identify, uh, to help identify all the objects in a particular image. Uh, so the use case is on the way. So before 2012, uh, we, the classic approaches were actually hand-made features uh, run through classic models. Uh, post that, um, deep neural networks or deep learning sort of took over. So uh, what we see here is a classification error, which is the percentage of times it makes a mistake, the model makes a mistake. Um, and as you can see from 2012, when deep learning sort of kicked off uh, in the research fields, uh, we see a drastic reduction in that errors. So some of the winning model architectures are basically AlexNet, uh, which led to 60 million parameters, uh, and Google the Net, uh, which I think is close to like 5 million parameters. So each of these boxes uh, actually denotes a, a function, a mathematical function. Uh, and combining these mathematical functions allows the model to actually learn complex features, combinations, that'll make it, uh, that'll help it be as correct as possible in this task. So with this rise as well as more compute, uh, uh, with this rise as well as with more computing capabilities, we're leading to more modern machine learning use cases. So each of our phones have smart assistants. Um, we're coming up with algorithms that actually predict if a particular person is wearing a mask or not in public. Uh, warehouse automation is rapidly becoming a thing with everybody moving to uh, e-market, e e, uh, e shopping and uh, ordering from online uh, warehouses. Uh, and then autonomous driving is also slowly becoming a thing if reality. So let's talk the infrastructure required for, for this. So typically to actually, uh, typically to create some of these models or machine learning uh, ideas, we need to have a cloud structure of some sort. Uh, it requires a lot of computing power. So most companies either have a private cloud of their own or make use of a public cloud service like Azure or Amazon uh, web services. So in the case of AWS in the public, public cloud environment, training typically happens uh, in high compute nodes or clusters that are closer to the data. So Amazon provides uh, a service called EMR which actually is Hadoop uh, and it allows uh, the data access from a lot of different sources uh, where both the input data as well as the labels typically exist. Um, and the evaluation environment is typically a container-based uh, deployment service. So Amazon allows you to register containers using the service called Elastic Container Registry and then you can deploy those containers into compute nodes called uh, EC2 uh, nodes. So to go to the next section of our talk, uh, we just wanna focus on two particular use cases. Uh, so on the left is um, warehouse automation and on the right is autonomous driving. And for both of these use cases, we need an object detection model of some sort. So on the left, like the warehouse detection, you need an object detection model that detects boxes, forklifts, other forklifts and other uh, objects in the warehouse. And for autonomous driving, you need the model to actually detect lanes, other cars, traffic signs, pedestrians, and so on. So if let's say we use one of these state-of-the-art models, which is a deep learning uh, complex architecture model, um, the, mar uh, the 
the infrastructure required to train something like this would still be in a cloud uh, source, resource for sure, uh, with the additional requirement of having GPUs. But the evaluation part of it is somewhere different. And for this part of the talk, uh, I'm going to hand it off to Mr. Prakash to talk to you about that. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, so we understood the fundamentals of uh, uh, machine learning here with the uh, use cases for the factory automation, factory warehouse, and the other one related to uh, autonomous vehicles. So what you see on this is a diagram uh, which indicates a location of the edge. So basically the uh, location is important because it can be anywhere between the user or the on-prem to the central cloud. So edge cloud resides between the central cloud and the user uh, or a sensor or whatever uh, that is uh, accessing the use case. So you can see here we have typically 20 to 100 millisecond uh, range of latency. Uh, and as the proximity to the user increases, you can bring it to edge, the latency reduces five to 20 millisecond range. Uh, and then if you come to the IoT edge, which is closer, more closer, you see the uh, latencies of one to five millisecond. So given the use case, uh, where is the uh, user, the client, and where is it being uh, computed and where is the training? So you have training and you have uh, inferencing and uh, for those two cases which you took. So they are at different location. Therefore, uh, the compute power needs to be uh, relevant in this case. So there is something called hash rate which is available for uh, measuring uh, the crypto computation requirements. And the same thing can be applied here. And then you can see that if you have training uh, closer to the storage and uh, with a large amount of data is better than 50% uh, of the training should be done in the cloud. Whereas if it is at the edge, uh, because of the constrained environment, you would like to reduce the uh, inferencing uh, computation because a lot of transcoding is required there for the media. The media needs to be uh, converted from one form to other form like audio, video, text, maybe MP4. So uh, MP3, MP4, and those kinds of uh, uh, plus sound also, everything requires transcoding. So a lot of uh, uh, compute power is spent in transcoding. So you only are left with 30% there. Whereas if you go to the IoT edge uh, in the factory floor, where most of the, uh, the thing you have to immediately react at real time. So inferencing is more important. So you need to have trained models. So this is what this is depicting. Next slide. So what we have is, uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, transfer learning stuff. Yep. Um, so as described, like as we go closer to the edge, we're constrained both on the amount of compute power that we have, as well as the high requirement for low latency. So the, in machine learning, there's a technique called knowledge distillation, uh, which actually allows us to make a lightweight version of the model uh, for these specifically low latency use cases. So the way it's done is you typically have uh, your uh, accurate model, which is uh, typically a deep uh, neural network. Uh, and that neural network is treated as a teacher. Uh, and you have a student model, which is a shallow network, which ideally tries to learn from the teacher by mimicking what the teacher is doing. Um, so the advantage of this is you have a lightweight model at the end, uh, which can be both trans tra transported easily, as well as uh, inferenced much quicker than the actual uh, model. The only trade-off would be a slight uh, loss in accuracy. Yeah. Next slide, yeah. So what we see, uh, we call overcoming the constraints for the model. So model is obviously some kind of a DAG or what we call graph, directed acyclic graph. Uh, now it has a format. So whatever you capture in the model uh, gets formatted into the uh, DAG uh, and it's uh, transported as a uh, ONNX uh, format. This is nothing that open 
networking uh, neural networking exchange format and uh, it has a run time which can be applied uh, at the deployment targets so training target can be in the cloud the deployment target can be in the edge and when you apply it uh, then uh, you can run with uh, run time so it provides interoperability uh, that's one it provides portability uh, and it provides a hardware uh, insertion so you can uh, have all those three which is critical for executing or overcoming the constraints uh, of the computing limitation as well as the distance limitation to get the best out of the uh, latency uh, that is desirable next slide so what we have here uh, just trying to uh, provide some uh, kind of a what does gpu do so hardware is inflexible because you may have an nvidia gpu you may have an intel gpu you may have uh, any gpu and they don't have similar architectures some may have different architecture but given a different architecture you cannot have hundreds of gpu in a given constrained environment at the best you can have one and maybe that is sliced into a number of instances we call it multi instance gpu so the requirement uh, happens to be multi instance gpu to be able to maximize the use of a given gpu and so if you uh, find this uh, clusters here we are seeing a training cluster a inference cluster and an analysis analytics cluster so if your training cluster is in the cloud it already has created the model and it has been now available to you you can download it so the edge uh, execution model just downloads whatever the training uh, cluster has created at a given time and it can keep on improving but uh, dynamically it can download which is very small onx and execute the onx uh, execution over the gpu over a given instance it can ask for as many instances it wants uh, to compute and then um, depending on suppose you get a four streams then you can execute that in the four streams uh, parallel tasking uh, executing uh, faster than normally you would do with a, just a general purpose cpu so that is uh, this removes not only the interoperability issue uh, it removes the portability issue because you are using a standard format uh, whether you have uh, azure or whether you have a aws or whether you have a open stack it doesn't matter because you can execute and that is where the uh, importance that you do what you need to do at a given edge whether it is a iot edge where you are mostly doing inferencing or if it is uh, let's say a transcoding plus uh, inferencing which you do in a, uh, like example like uh, the other one uh, we mentioned about the uh, training etc so next slide given uh of course this is i am repeating uh, aws has machine learning infrastructure and uh, map reduce which is the emr uh, amazon offers the various storage like your object storage the file storage the hadoop for the big data you have the dynamo db for the uh, key values and then you have got the uh, other uh, similar relational data services and uh, etc for big analytics and bi and redshift and uh, glacier etc similarly you got evaluation environment there usually you are more focused on the execution and there is deployment place so here you have the container service elastic container service uh, which is a, you register and use it and then you also have the standard amazon ec2 plus you got the fargate which is mostly for the uh, what do you call the abstract uh, lambda uh, that is services and so overall you got the services which are there so amazon offers you different services now given to uh, what do we have especially we spoke about two important ones one is the wavelength uh, i am going to describe wavelength because wavelength means you have a cell tower and if your autonomous driving is happening let's say at some place and uh, you want the low latency to be applied to that so what you do is your computational highway computation needs to be done somewhere and that needs to be close to cell tower so your wavelength zone is a offer from uh, amazon working with the uh, service uh, telco service providers uh, the mobile service providers and provides your data center capability so you can take that wavelength zone now outpost is something which is different this is like hey you want to be part of the amazon system yet you want to be closer so you don't want to build your own anything so a campus environment like cmu let's say Carnegie Mellon University. If they have the AWS outpost, what they do is they will size what is my use case. Oh, I am going to do uh, what you call the uh, 
autonomous uh, vehicle which is uh, running in close to my uh, campus and i am doing some testing on it so i will size what is required uh, okay we need a let's say wavelength uh, i need a console which i can use wavelength with uh, virtual private cloud and so you identify these are the uh, am aml stuff which i need etc could be sage or something and so what you can do is you can size it and order it and you don't have to order the 100000 uh, racks rather you order couple of racks so that you can uh, prepare the site and uh, uh, validate it and uh, get the get it shipped and uh, start installing one or two and start building so it's a rapid deployment of outposts which can be tied with the wavelength so that your uh, clusters can be separated out as we mentioned earlier cluster which cluster so if you want computer if you want something to do with the uh, evaluation Uh, that can be closer. Uh, that can be in your uh, closer to your environment, uh, which is in the outpost. But if you want uh, s- uh, something which is uh, related to storing and all, uh, it could be put there closer with the uh, lesser nanosecond. It could be uh, so part of the function can be here, part of the function. So it's a functional com- split. How you want to do, uh, how you want to uh, design the cluster. Those are other aspects. But basically, you can. split the functionality across whatever is most optimum used that whether you use wavelength zone or whether you use outpost it's a question of decision making and that you can include in your design next slide so what we are seeing is uh, aws offers is something called sage maker which is a ml development uh, tool uh, where you label build your uh, studio with all your definitions of what the model is and how you want to uh, capture the features and outcomes and uh, how would you go about it so this is the uh, label build train tune and deploy this so the same similar offer is there from kubeflow platform for uh, from kubernetes so if kubernetes exists anywhere you can run your kubeflow and what does it do it does the same thing uh, like extract the data generate the state generate the schema transform the data train the model validate the model and serve the model so basically what you can do is if you have a, anywhere a kube kubernetes you can apply a kube flow so what we are trying to do here is to explain how aws ai ml landscape can be applied to open infra that was the goal go ahead next slide so you can see the kube flow platform here it runs anywhere where kubernetes is available a cluster of kubernetes and that you can see here even the on prem can use it or local can use it azure can so whether it is a cloud or a on prem environment all you need to do is provide the a scaffolding of all the applications that are required ml tools that are required and then uh, start building the pipeline either using argo or uh, your you can use your uh, kubeflow itself for the ai ml flows and execute them and the, the, uh, on the right side what you see is tensorflow flow serving pytorch serving is still there is service mesh argo is again pipeline so you can prometheus is for uh, your uh, what do you call the uh, collection of uh, all the uh, all the in, uh, interrupts and all that or whatever if something goes wrong fault detection etc and similarly is the uh, spartacus so at the end of it what we have got is we can replicate this in a open infra how let's see next so you can see here whatever applications we had uh, said we can reimagine and uh, process like outpost and wavelength Uh, for edge can be applied in even in the open infra on in open infra we have got uh, air ship which is a major project uh, and so is starling x for the distributed cloud uh, distributed edge so we can use these for creating the pools uh, of bare metals uh, using ionic and then a cluster api with kubernetes control plane can manage the workload clusters whether you Uh, want to take a hybrid approach of using the uh, clouds you can as well have resources from the cloud by uh, like we have outpost wavelength we can combine the uh, hybrid cloud approach with the open shift or even with the uh, what do you call vmware or open stack uh, platforms and then uh, we, it's able to interop and port portable interoperability portability for ai ml we already have given you on and access the formula all you need to do is you have to get the scaffolding on top of it and whether you want to do it in the cloud or edge uh, whatever split you want to do you can do it with the clusters properly designed and this can also be applied to 5g core right uh, whether you have a 
uh, CUDU for the uh, baseband unit, or you can do it for the radio unit, or RAN, even IoT gateway. So distributed AI models can be adopted over Airship and Starling X, which are open infra project with the assistance of Kubeflow and uh, other models. And the models are based on the use case. You can bring them and adopt and use. So this is our message that open infra is ready. Uh, and it's just how you imagine, how you deploy. And so this is our uh, objective to see how we can do what cloud can do. You can do uh, even in the open, uh, even in the, what do you call the on-prem, which can be used by telcos. Thank you very much.